Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth of our webinars and live events for the marathon, uh, upcoming marathon in Ballarat. Uh, it's a really exciting one today, and I think one that we'll be able to watch tonight and then look back on uh, and get more information. I think make more sense for some of the first time marathon runners and people who've just got into training, like myself, um, that are really looking forward to the first run, but then looking to improve after that. I think this would be a, a really good resource moving forward. Um, more people are coming in now, but we um, will get started very shortly. So tonight it is Dr. Ryan Warren, uh, who is presenting his lecture out at the University for Exercise uh, and Sports Science. He specialises in high performance uh, athlete physiology and biomechanics. Uh, he's an active distance runner, triathlete. Uh, he's an active cycling and running coach, uh, success with national level uh, athletes, including representation at world championships in road cycling, track cycling and BMX. Uh, so I had to read a bit of that just to make sure I get it all right. But Ryan's also running uh, in the upcoming marathon as well. Um, and he'll be going quite speedy. I don't know whether he'll want me to say how fast he's going to go, but uh, if you do see him on the day, make sure you, you cheer him on as well. Uh, I'll hand over to you now, Ryan. Thank you very much, Jace. Uh, yeah, you can say I'm, I'm going to try and run under 240. Might be a bit ambitious, but um, we'll see how we go, hey? Huge. So let me just set up my screen for a moment. Um, perfect, Jace, have you got that? Yep, we should be live with that now. Great. Um, so before we start and to follow on a little bit about what Jason said um, in, in my bio there, I'll give a little bit of an introduction about me um, because it'll kind of help contextualize a, a bit what I've said tonight. Um, so my training journey started a long time ago, way, way back in 1999. I had a um, back injury before that I mean, in 97, 98, and couldn't couldn't walk. Um, and as part of the rehab for that, cycling was advised, and I started riding mountain bikes um, and got addicted to cycling really, really quickly. Um, and that started to grow. I got addicted to um, to road cycling, to to track cycling, to mountain biking, including downhill, um, and found most success in, in the sport of of sprint cycling. Um, which is the cycling race on the, on the velodrome? Um, very very short, very fast. At events less than a minute in duration. Once I finished that though, um, in 2019, I I, I kind of got sick of spending too much time in the gym. Like spending five days a week in the gym, two days at Melbourne on the track, and and two or three days on the ergo, um, and just doing short efforts. And I, and I thought, what's the furthest furthest thing away from sprint cycling? Because I want to do something else. Um, and I arrived at long distance swimming and long distance running. And the idea of long distance swimming really didn't appeal to me. And so I started this crazy 180 journey um, into marathon running. And as part of that process, as you can kind of see by the, the two photos there on top left and the one below it, I lost around 20 kilos of, of muscle um, and all of my speed that went with that. Um, in the last year, um, year and a half I've, I've kind of um, dived into triathlon a little bit more and, and recently completed the Geelong 70.3 a, a few weeks ago um, and I'll be attempting to run um, under under 240 at Ballarat um, and so I've had some success as an athlete not not tremendous certainly um, not like other people you see running on the course on the weekend but I have at all times strived to to try and get better and in part of that um, or, or to help with that um, I undertook study, so I undertook a degree in exercise science, then an honours degree, um, and then a, later a PhD um, specialising in fatigue and fatigue resistance um, in the sport of cycling. Um, and so all of my life, really, since I was, I was um, before a teenager, has been around sport about how to get better for endurance sports or, or individual sports, how to optimize training, how to optimize load, um, and how to train more um, without breaking down. Because ultimately that's what we're, we're all trying to achieve. How do we train more um, and fit it in with our life without breaking down? Um, and through part of that, 
discovery, I, I came across the Norwegian model. And I think a lot of that was because of the soreness and pain I was experiencing um, starting running um, and about of shin splints and plantar fasciitis and, and everything. And, and I didn't realize that I was, I was training much too hard um, when I was comparing that to, to cycling. And so in large part, tonight's presentation is around the Norwegian model, but it also shares some of my insights about kind of how I arrived there and how I think others have arrived at the Norwegian model. Um, so the title of this slide is, is the Norwegian model the next step in run training evolution? Um, and now we can see the pictures there of the Ingebrigtsen brothers, um, Henrik and, and Jakob Ingebrigtsen, and they're probably the poster boys for this um, Norwegian model, but they're certainly not the founders of this Norwegian model at all. Um, the story is a lot older than them. And it goes back to the early thousands with another guy, Mar Marius Backen. Um, but it goes further back than that um, because it's really a story about optimization um, and about maximizing adaptation. So what are we trying to do when we adapt to training? Really all um, adaptation to all training comes back to this idea of this general adaptation syndrome, which is um, this conceptual idea presented by, by a guy named Hans Salyer back in the 50s. And he really conceptualized that when we um, train, this wasn't necessarily meant in the lens of exercise, but it still works well. We have a baseline of fitness. When we add a stressor, which in the case of training is, is exercise, we get an alarm or a shock, shock to that system, and that's acute fatigue. Um, if we allow time um, to adapt from that, we develop some resistance. Um, if we keep pushing it, we run into this exhaustion phase. That's more commonly known as the supercompensation model in training circles. And really what it represents is this theoretical construct about where we're trying to structure training in a way that um, we get fitter, that we get better, um, that we improve as a result of that training. And so you can see in, in chart A there, um, showing this line, green line trending upward. And what that's showing is that we have a baseline of fitness. When we add a training stimulus, we get that fatigue and our baseline actually dips down. When we recover from that though, we adapt to those stresses, those mechanical, those metabolic, neurological stresses, and we get a little bit better. Then we add a training stimulus again, we adapt from that, we get a little bit fitter again, and so on. And so that line trends upward. And that term is super compensation, above compensation. We're, we're getting a new fitness um, above where we were. If we don't get it quite right, we run, run into this chart C here, which is where we don't allow um, enough recovery to really progress at all. But the worst case scenario is this, is this chart B here, where we train and then we run into fatigue and we train again um, too early and we get into more fatigue and so on and so on and so forth. And so, as I said, this is really a story of um, optimization around training. But in order to optimize run training, well, we have to first know what makes a good endurance runner. Uh, and so these are some of the um, physical factors that I stumbled upon looking through through research um, over the years and, and in part making this um, presentation. At the top, we have velocity. Um, velocity is, is speed in a straight line. So you can think of speed as well. S speed is what wins races. It, it, it's who can hold the highest speed um, across the race is going to win. They'll, they'll cover the distance in the shortest time. Um, so ultimately velocity is what, what wins races in endurance sport. Below that is maximal mean power output. Now in running, we don't do a tremendous job of measuring that um, and that's due to technological constraints. There are some recent developments um, in power meters, most notably the stride foot pods that attempt to do that, but also Garmin, Koros, um, Sunto watches will attempt to do that as well. In other sports like cycling, um, it's much more common to do that. But maximal um, mean power output is the force we put in to the ground and, and how quickly we do it. So even if we don't measure it, we, we certainly are performing it. Um, and in large part, that determines our stride 
frequency in our stride rate. So stride frequent, um, sorry, so that should say SLSR, um, stride length and stride rate. So stride length is, is how long we stride and, and stride rate is how often. And that's really determined by how long we're in the air. And of course, that's determined by the force we put into the ground. So maximal mean power kind of sits under that straight line speed. Below that is time to exhaustion. So how long you take to get tired, given it a, a particular um, pace. To take the marathon, for example, hoping to hold somewhere around that 347, 348 pace um, in a couple of weeks time. Through 10K, that's going to be quite easy. Through 20Ks, it should be should be relatively easy. At 30Ks, it's going to be hard. And at 36Ks, it's going to be excruciating. Um, and so time to exhaustion is kind of that concept. How long can you run at a, at a given um, pace? Below that is economy. Now, economy is a bit of a buzzword in, in sports science and running circles at the moment, but it really refers to how much oxygen you consume for running at a given pace. Um, and so it's a bit like fuel efficiency in a car. If you're driving along the highway um, in a non-efficient or economical car, you might be using eight, 10 litres per hundred and an efficient or economical car might be using four. And that's in large part determined by biomechanics. Some of that you can modify. Um, so for instance, stride rate, um, other things you can't necessarily modify because they're um, depend on the arrangement of your muscles, tendons, tissue. Below that is a concept VO2 max and fractional utilization. And we'll spend a bit of time on that today. VO2 max is how much oxygen we can take up um, and distribute around the body. And fractional utilization is, is just a fancy term. Um, at what point of VO2 max does your lactate threshold occur? Um, and so for most people that occurs somewhere around 80%, but that's certainly not true for, for all people. More broadly than that, though, we have this pyramid of endurance performance, and it's a nice um, conceptual thing to think about um, in terms of helping you structure your training. As I said, we have a velocity at the top. That's how fast you go. Below that is external work. That's the power you produce, the force you put into the ground. Below that, though, is internal work. And internal work um, is the physiology that produces that external work. Um, so when we start to run, we will notice that we have a response to that running. Our heart rate will increase, our breathing will increase, our sweating will increase, our body temperature, our blood flow. They're all responses to exercise. And they are the, that's the internal work or the internal responses to produce the force we put into the ground. But of course, below that is, is energy. And so we need to, to fuel that internal work. We need to fuel the heart rate, the blood flow, the breathing. Um, and so that all comes about from energy or the, or the calories we, we can store. The reason that's true is because of the first law of thermo, thermodynamics in which energy can't be created or destroyed, only transferred or transformed um, from one object or form to another. And so we have the amount of energy we have. And what we are trying to do is create internal work in the most efficient way to create external work in the most efficient way to move um, as rapidly as we can with the least cost um, in doing so. Now, internal work is a complex thing and it, it ties in um, in great deal to, to what makes a threshold and how we un understand zones. Um, external work is a relatively simple concept. If we were to all go out right now um, and run 10 Ks at four minute K pace, then we have all performed the same amount of external work. For me, that's relatively easy. That's a six out of 10. For um, Tom DeCanto running on the weekend, that's a two out of 10. For a beginner, a park runner, that might be a nine out of 10. And so external work is, is the same, but internal work, the cost of that's very, very different. And that really is the whole premise of training load, which is the, the combination of internal versus external work. How much external work do we uh, perform that we can quantify? And what was the cost of that work? The reason though um, we try to do that is to optimize training. But in order to understand a training load, then we need to understand how hard something is. And to understand how, so how hard something is, then we have to understand what a zone is and how we work out what a zone is. So training zones 
are a way in which we describe training from easy to hard. And so you might see a whole bunch of training zones, um, A1 to 5, T1 to 5, Z1 to 7, um, E1 to, to, to 5. Um, there can be nine zone systems, um, whatever it is. In science, we tend to use the three zone system from moderate, heavy, severe, and they tend to call them domains rather than zones. But conceptually, that they're, they're talking about the same thing. This transition from rest to moderate exercise to more difficult exercise. I quite like this chart just because it has um, other identifiers in there like lactate threshold and critical power speed, um, etc. But the point is we're trying to identify what makes easy training from hard training. Um, and typically those zones are um, anchored or decided upon by what we call absolute anchors, which are a blunt force instruments. So an absolute anchor, if you were to run on a treadmill to maximal, then it might be the maximal pace you achieve or the maximum heart rate you achieve um, or the maximum VO2 you achieve if you're, if you're reporting that. The problem with using that to anchor training is that we can't just say, well, for all people, lactate threshold occurs at 80% of VO2 max. Um, therefore, you want to train at 80% VO2 max because of it, it might occur there for some people, but it won't occur there for all people. Um, and that's one of the critical determinants of, of running ability for endurance running is how, how high that um, lactate threshold is, is, is as a proportion of VO2 max. So it doesn't always occur at the same point. And so what we try to do is, is um, anchor to these relative zones and relative um, anchors are things like blood lactate, um, ventilatory thresholds and so on. And they're described here. When we um, take data from an example here, like a step test um, on a treadmill, or this is taken from cycling where power increases, but it shows the same thing conceptually. When we start to pedal harder, um, we get to this point where we have our lactate threshold one, which occurs around about one and a half millimoles in this person, um, and then lactate threshold two, which occurs somewhere around four millimoles. Now, they're not hard and fast rules. Generally, two and four are considered first and second threshold, but not always. Often, um, it depends on the, the steepness of that ramp um, or when you increase more than one millimole um, over the, the preceding workload. There are a whole, whole bunch of ways in which we try to define that. But the point is that lactate increases over time. If, if workload increases, lactate increases. Now, the amount of oxygen we breathe in and the amount of carbon dioxide we breathe out also increases. But we get to a point where the carbon dioxide we breathe out increases disproportionately. Um, that point is what we call the ventilatory threshold. Now, as I'll talk about later, the lactate threshold and the ventilatory threshold pro probably represent the same physiological event. There's a, a little bit of um, debate around that, but they probably represent the same physiological event. And so when we hit that threshold, you'll see that point of lactate threshold and point of ventilatory threshold kind of occur at the same point. Um, and so what we are trying to do with all of that is work out what's the point at which you start to accumulate lactate? Um, what's the point at which you start to breathe more carbon dioxide? And it's all in an attempt to work out how hard we're going. Because if we can work out how hard we're going and we know our external work, so we're running 10K at four minute K pace, then we can use that to describe training. Um, and we arrive at these um, training zones like this from long intensity training all the way through to short sprint training and everything in between. That can be used to describe training here. Training is often described or training intensity by training intensity distribution, which is how much time we spend, spend in our zones. The most common um, models are polarized pyramidal um, threshold. Pyramidal is perhaps the most well known and, and it just is from the word pyramid. So building blocks on top of blocks. And it means that you might start with an aerobic base block and then add a threshold block, then a threshold two block and a speed block or whatever. So you're stacking blocks on blocks. 
polarized is is really our um, conceptual idea around 80 20 training so 80 percent of your times in in zone one and 20 percent in in zone three um, based on that three zone system and then threshold training which really is the Norwegian model, is about trying to optimize it. So you're spending more time um, in those middle zones around three and four. Of course, you uh, might put two and two together here and go, well, yeah, but I could make any type of training I want, a bit of zone one, a bit of zone two, a bit of zone four, and so on. And if you modify that training, then, then we just call that a unique training intensity distribution. What's the purpose of knowing all this? Well, we can categorize how people train. So this is a great paper um, by Casado um, and colleagues called Training Periodization Methods, Intensity Distribution and Volume in Highly Trained and Elite Distance Runners. Um, these charts here, or these figures, are comparing uh, 1500 meters runners versus marathon runners. If we look at chart C here, and we look at broad training intensity distribution, um, compared to 1500 meters of black and marathoners in gray, we can see that both spend more time, most of their time in, in zone one, um, little time in zone three, and a bit of time in zone two, particularly the marathon runners. If we look at the breakdown of um, 1500 meter versus marathon runner, which is A is 1500 and B is marathon runner, um, we can see for the 1500 meter, Runner, Monday zone one, um, Tuesdays of zone three, Wednesday's a bit of zone two, um, Thursday is, uh, looks like zone two again, Friday's zone one, Saturday zone three, Sunday zone two. Um, the difference between them and the marathon runner is that the marathon runner spends a bit more time at zone two because their sport requires that. Um, it, it tends to be a little bit longer um, and a little less speedy um, it, it compared to outright 1500 meter speed. However, there is a cost associated with going too hard. So even 1500 meter runners tend to spend a, a, a portion of their time around this zone too. And so the finding of this study was, the main finding of the present review is that highly trained middle and long distance runners typically follow a pyramidal training intensity distribution characterized by conducting much of the training with, within zone two at or just below velocity at lactate threshold two. So that second lactate um, inflection point. Um, then it says they uh, most athletes use the uh, hard day, easy day approach as well. When we dive into the mechanisms about that training near or at um, velocity at lactate threshold two, they say, they say, while the mechanistic explanation for the relationship between con training conducted near velocity at lactate threshold two and the improvement in performance and its physiological determinants cannot be elucidated yet, it has been proposed that exercising at this specific intensity improves muscle specific clearing of lactate as opposed to reducing lactate production's mechanisms. Since only recruited motor units are likely to experience increases in mitochondrial and capillary density, it may be speculated that training near lactate threshold two optimizes the number of motor units recruited without the consequences of elevated levels of catecholamines likely to be experienced with zone three training. Now that's a whole heap of words there, but I'll dive down into what that means later. But the, the takeaway point there is that they're saying, well, Actually, a lot of um, middle distance and, and long distance runners, marathon runners, spend their time approaching but not crossing lactate threshold two. But the story is more complicated than that. If we look at this article, which is also fantastic um, by Campos and colleagues, they found almost the opposite. The studies that use greater volumes of low intensity training, such as those characterized by pyramidal and polarized TID approaches, recorded, reported greater improvements in endurance performance than those which used a threshold training intensity distribution. So you might say, well, hang on here. How have we got apples and oranges? One saying spend time at lactate threshold two, the other saying don't. And the answer is, we're not particularly good at identifying thresholds. This is a fantastic paper um, by Nicholas Jamnik, who is a, a very, very good runner in his own right. So a 14 minute 5K runner, a 225 marathon runner. 
And this is an examination and critique of current methods to determine exercise intensity. And really what he says is that we're OK at identifying lactate threshold one. Um, but this point here in red, there is little evidence to support the validity of most commonly used methods with the exception of critical power and critical speed to delineate the heavy and severe domains of exercise, meaning zone two and three on that three zone system. So he's just dropped the mic and said, well, we're actually not that good at identifying thresholds anyway. And the story is more complicated than that when you chuck coaches into the mix. And so we tend to have these cultural definitions of threshold based around words like hard, fast, intense, exhaustion. Um, and we think about images like this, where the guy bends over, um, puffing, catching his breath, trying to recover. But we might not necessarily need to push that hard. Um, and Ma Marius Backen, who I'll return to, a Norwegian, really the father of, of um, Norwegian model, said, well, maybe we should be, be striving more for a tireless state of intensity. There was others before him that, that pushed for the same thing. Um, if we talk to um, previous successful Australia, Australian runners, um, for instance, Sean Crichton um, in interview says he, he didn't, he seldom spent time at race pace. Um, he spent a lot of his, his training doing a little slower than race pace. If we look at um, Steve Monaghetti from Ballarat, um, reading his book, he used to do club races after long runs. Um, now, I, I, I'm sure Steve Monaghetti didn't go slow, but I'm also confident that he's not racing those club races at the same level of intensity um, that he would be, you know, if he was lining up for, for Berlin Marathon or something. Um, and so maybe without even being that aware of it, they were trying to optimise their training load and trying to say, well, how can we um, get the stimulus of race pace intensity um, without breaking down too much. And the problem with going too hard is that we do start to break down. Um, we have inflammatory responses to that impact and shock. So the faster we run, the more ground reaction force we have, the more shock we have. Um, and so we have inflammatory markers and, and stress markers like cort cortisol, C-reactive protein, um, creatine kinase, urea, a, a, a whole bunch of things that occur with that. But we also have peripheral and central fatigue. So fatigue at the muscle um, and fatigue at the brain, which is central, maybe from a depletion of, of neurotransmitters. And that could simply be because we're um, activating our sympathetic nervous system to a higher extent, which is, is really triggering that fight, fight or flight um, response. And it takes time to come back from that. And so the idea is that maybe we want to rein it back a little bit. And so the takeaway from both of those studies was the runners spend most of their time in easy zones and less so in intense or very intense zones. What they are trying to do and what we are trying to do is optimize training load and the delivery of intensity and volume to ensure quality. Quality is the key. If it has a purpose to your training, um, then you could argue it has quality. So with all that in mind, we arrive at the Norwegian model. What is the Norwegian model? It's a training system where an emphasis is placed on maximizing the time spent just below the lactate threshold, often at predetermined blood lactate anchors, typically around two and four millimoles. It is suggested that 30 to 40% of weekly training is spent at controlled intensity, meaning two to four millimole. Now, if you think about the runner that runs 10 hours a week, we're saying three to four hours at threshold. And that's not talking a threshold session where you go, um, to Vic Park and, and do four by three K. It's it's and then you've got to warm up and cool down and that session goes for an hour. That's saying no, we want to spend four hours per week in that rep at that intensity. Um, and so when you think about your own training, you, you would say, well, there's no way I can do that. And, and the reason you can't do that is because you're probably going too hard. And that's because of our cultural definitions of what makes a, a threshold. And so we need to monitor that accordingly. So what is the history of the Norwegian model? I don't think the Norwegian model is, is um, anything too creative um, or um, seminal in its own, own way. Really, it is, as the adult adage says, um, everything old is, is new again. And so before we arrived at this Norwegian model, 
We had Lydiad and Van Aken who established a need for developing a big aerobic base through high training volumes at an easy pace. We also had Gershla um, and much later Maffetone who trained their athletes within specific heart rate ranges, often lower heart rates. Zatapec and Igwo covered interval training at sub-maximal paces and efforts. Bowman demonstrated the usefulness of hard day, easy day approaches. Um, Ver, Verhul employed the use of daily 400 metre and longer 1000 metre and 2000 metre reps with long active recoveries or floats without overexertion, which sounds a lot like the Norwegian model. But Marius Bakken realised how to integrate it all and is the father of the Norwegian model. The key difference is that lactate guided Bakken's training. Um, and so he monitored what he was doing. Now, Marius Backen was incredibly good. Back in the early thousands, um, he was he was running 13.05 for the 5K, um, pre-Super Shoe era, um, where it was quite rare to see anyone who wasn't a, of an East African um, nation performing that well. And so he must have been doing something something right, and we've seen success, of course, with the Ingebrits and brothers as well. So he's measuring lactate, and that's the key difference with his training, which begs the question, what is lactate and why do we produce it? So if you're the kind of person who doesn't necessarily like um, chemistry or biology too much, um, you can pay a bit less attention to this part um, and, and come back in where I talk about how we measure lactate in a moment. But I'm about to spend a few minutes talking about um, some of the physiological basis of, of what lactate is and why we produce it. So first up, lactate is the most misunderstood molecule in sports science, and that comes from early studies. So way back in the 30s, French scientists were using um, frogs' legs and electrically stimulating them. And when they electrically stimulated those frogs' legs, they measured the presence of lactate. If we fast forward a little bit to the 40s and 50s, we started to get human trials and we would exercise at increasing intensity, so run a little bit faster. Um, and when we were exercising at these increasing intensities, what do you know? People started to measure this increase in lactate as well. And so it's a story of correlation and causation. We went, well, pain occurs when I start to push harder. It starts to feel unpleasant and lactate occurs. So maybe lactate is the cause of that fatigue and that pain. It wasn't until much later um, into the 90s where, where we got to this um, guy, George Brooks, who really turned the whole field on his head and said, well, maybe we've been thinking about it the wrong way. Lactate could actually be a fuel and maybe we can take it to other parts of the body to deal with it. And so lactate is a signal, signaling molecule that provides energy for oxidative metabolism. Um, and now it's measured in concentration, not volume. Now that's quite important um, because concentration will change with plasma volume. So if your blood volume changes because you're sweating um, or your hydration status changes, you become more or less hydrated um, or blood is redistributed to different parts of the body for cooling, then your lactate concentration might change and so that is quite important um, as i'll talk about later the subsequent effect of reps reps on reps on reps can also increase lactate so it's called lactate stacking um, and as i mentioned earlier if you run at a continuous pace eventually that that pace becomes more difficult and lactate will go up so lactate doesn't cause fatigue but it is associated um, with exercise intensities that if maintained or exceeded will cause fatigue so why do we produce it? Really, it comes back to two um, broad principles, which are the all or nothing principles and Henneman's size principle. So humans are inherently um, efficient or inherently lazy from a biological perspective, from an evolutionary lens that afforded us um, great survivability in that we didn't spend energy until we needed to spend, spend energy. And the Henneman size principle is a little bit related to that. And the Henneman size principle says that we will recruit small, slow twitch fibers first before big, fast twitch fibers. And now I'm glad it's that way around and not the other way around because activities of daily living like 
brushing our teeth, putting on glasses, um, whatever it might be, would become really, really impossible to do if you were in recruiting um, your muscle, big muscle fibers first, and, and you know, and continually punching yourself in the face while, while trying to do those things. Um, and related to that is the all or nothing principle. So when we decide how many muscle fibers or motor units we want to recruit, we don't have any modulation of those. They are either on or off, yes or no. So they, they recruit. When we're um, running along at low intensities, we recruit slow twitch fibers and not many of them. As we get go more and more intense and we start to run faster and faster, we recruit type 2A fibers and then type 2B fibers. Um, they're bigger fibers, they are more costly to run, um, and so we start to run into the problem of how we create energy. You might remember um, back from biology or P about the energy systems. There are broadly three energy systems. We have our ATP CP system, which runs on stored adenosine triphosphate and, and um, creatine phosphate and lasts somewhere around five to 10 seconds. At the other end of that, we have our oxidative energy system where we use oxygen um, to break down fatty acids or carbohydrates um, to provide us energy. In the middle though, we have um, glycolysis. So glycolysis is the breakdown of stored sugars. Um, the beauty of the glycolytic system is that it's really rapid, but it's also really costly. When we start to push harder and harder and recruit those bigger, faster fibers, they run on glycogen and on glucose. They are anaerobic fibers, anaerobic meaning without the presence of oxygen. And so when we do have oxygen, um, every gram of carbohydrate produces 38 molecules of ATP, which is the thing that um, creates life. It, it, is, it is the basis of energy for all our cells. Um, of those 38 ATP, two come from glycolytic pathway or glycolysis, two from the Kred cycle and 34 from the electron transport chain. It, it's virtually limitless, but it's very slow. Um, and so when we start to recruit those bigger fibers and we want to move more forcefully, we have to use the glycolytic pathway after we run out of that ATP CP um, energy system, which happens quite rapidly. So what happens? Glycolysis breaks down glucose and, and glycogen into three uh, into two three carbon chain uh, molecules called pyruvates. So glycogen and glucose are split into these things called pyruvates. Um, the creation of that pyruvate though creates two ATP, which is the thing that provides energy. Along with that though, it generates two hydrogen ions um, and two molecules of water. Now hydrogen ions are quite acidic, um, which we'll return to. Um, and that process doesn't require oxygen, which makes it rapidly available fuel source for those type 2B, type 2A fibers. Once we get to that point though, if we then back off intensity and oxygen's available, we take that pyruvate that we've created, it goes to the mitochondria, um, it's converted to acetyl coenzyme A, goes through the citric acid cycle and becomes energy. You don't need to remember those steps. What you do remember if intensity backs off, we deal with it. Um, if, it run, if intensity remains high though, we, we run into a problem. And we deal with that problem through the creation of lactate and buffering. And so lactate is the combination of pyruvate and hydrogens. So when we take the, the pyruvate and those hydrogen ions floating around um, and combine them together, we create lactate. If intensity drops off after that point, we can resynthesize that um, to create new energy or, or new sugars. If we can't do that though, we run into this point where we accumulate lactate quicker than we can um, clear it. And that's called the lactate threshold. So we're producing lactate and we can't get rid of it. Um, and this creation of energy from this glycolytic pathway creates an acidic, prob uh, an acidic environment. And that's problematic. The reason that acidic environment is problematic is because it interrupts the cell's ability to release calcium. Um, and that ultimately stops muscle contraction. If we can't release calcium from, from the cell, then we can't initiate muscle contraction. And it's probably that which forces us to slow down. And so lactate 
isn't at fault there. If anything, lactate reduces that acidic environment because it's a bit like a soak um, and it soaks up the acidic um, pyruvate and hydrogen molecules and, and tends to deal with them so we can process them in another way. And so lactate itself certainly doesn't cause fatigue, rather it's, it's a flag that acidity is increasing. So you can think lactate, you know, is, is, the, is the person firing the flare that's telling us the, the ship is sinking. Um, now, we aren't necessarily hopeless against that. What we try to do to deal with that is buffer, and that's what I was talking about earlier, where our carbon dioxide increases as well. The opposite to an acid is a base. And so we try to neutralize that acidic environment by creating a basic environment. It's called the bicarbonate buffering system. Um, and briefly, sodium bicarbonate is dumped into the bloodstream. And then through a series of, of steps, we um, try to convert that to carbon dioxide and then breathe it out. Um, yeah, so we try to deal with that excess um, sodium bicarbonate by breathing it off as carbon dioxide, which is what we see when we spike this threshold. So, to recap, intensity is probably, uh, intensity related to fatigue is mostly due to that acidic environment and calcium inter interruption. Um, lactate is the flag that that's going on. And that's why we want to measure lactate because it's telling us something's going on inside your body now that you're crossing this point of no return and you're recruiting muscle fibers and you're operating in such a way that will cause fatigue if you don't back off. And that's why back in had his lactate monitor monitoring. It's why we recorded all these sessions um, and the Norwegians do, they record it to great detail. So that's all of the physiology talk out of the way. Um, how do we measure lactate? Um, here is here are some videos of me measuring lactate in the field um, and in the lab. So this is with a cyclist Nick, who I'll return to later. Nick's riding along at increasing intensities from from low two hundreds to four hundred and something. I can't remember exactly. At the end of each three minute rep, um, I take a, a a pin prick and a blood measurement, and it will return the value that we're interested in. Now that's only recording lactate. We also got Nick in the lab and we recorded lactate and the oxygen he um, consumes and the carbon dioxide he produces, which is trying to work out that point. When's he crossing his threshold in terms of blood lactate? Um, and when's he crossing that point in terms of, um, in terms of carbon dioxide? Um, and so we were measuring those things as well as heart rate. And we're trying to look at, at points um, lactate concentrations around 2.5, 3.5, and 4.5 um, millimoles. As I said, though, the reason we want those is because they represent states of intensity um, of how difficult is training. So we are using that lactate to guide thresholds um, to try to ultimately optimize his training and add more stress. So, the idea of all training is to add more stress and recover from it as quickly as, pos as possible. That's a general adaptation syndrome. And so the question comes, how can we add more stress to training without breakdown? Which is uh, done by monitoring and dosing intensity accordingly, which is the premise of the Norwegian model. We're trying to get this green line to trend up. An interesting fact, work slightly above the lactate threshold too, or critical torque, which is a, a, another way we might measure that through, through cycling or running on a treadmill. Work slightly above lactate threshold two is four to five times more fatiguing than work under lactate threshold two. So slightly over is four to five times more fatiguing than work slightly under. That means we can get close to the fire without jumping in and potentially get benefits from that. And so maybe as a way to implement that into training, we want to move away from that classical approach of one threshold, one VO2 session per week, maybe to four to six thresholds a week and, and one high intensity workout. What we are really trying to do is add stress without the requisite breakdown. 
and, and the idea to borrow from strength and conditioning, time under tension comes to mind. Time under tension in the gym just means how long are you spending actually performing the exercise or performing the lift? So how many seconds were you squatting for? The same thing is really true here. We're trying to maximize the time we spend close to threshold um, without jumping in that fire. So why is the Norwegian model so successful in running? And it is successful in running. Um, the Norwegians, um, particularly the Inga Brits and brothers, but also um, Norstad, there, there's a few of those that are employing this model and they're, they're doing, uh, Norda, sorry, doing um, very well with that. Why is it so successful? I would say probably due to mechanical load. So when we run, we will have two to three times our body weight striking the ground. So when we hit the ground, we have this ground reaction force. We don't sink into the ground, the ground provides a reaction force. The faster we go, the more that ground reaction force is. And so we might go from two to three to four to five times body weight if we're starting to sprint. Uh, maybe we're, we're kicking down in those last 15 second efforts of a mono. Um, and that leads to repetitive micro trauma and soreness and damage. That is, they are the classical symptoms of DOM. Um, it also leads to those in, increased um, stress and inflammatory markers I mentioned about cortisol, C-reactive protein, creatine kinase, urea, um, and we're triggering that, that fight or flight um, um, pathway. And so I think the reason the Norwegian model is so successful and, and back and also believe the same is that by slowing down slightly, we can probably reduce that mechanical load a bit and we can therefore do more of it. So maybe instead of going two sessions a week, we go to four or we go to six. As I mentioned, though, there, there's probably metabolic factors about how we clear that lactate or buffer that lactate that are related um, to um, this idea about why it might be successful. So to understand why the Norwegian model might work, we first need to understand how it's characterized. And I'll, I'll touch on this more on the next slide. But broadly, the Norwegian model is um, broken into three types of training, low intensity, control threshold, and high intensity. Typically low intensity is, is six to 10 times a week continuous training at, at zone one. That, that's a long run or a, a recovery jog of 10, 14K uh, between sessions. At the other end is our high intensity training, which happens one, maybe two times per week. And that's um, typically characterized by hill sprints. Um, and it's it's quite uh, toxic. It's, it's typically around eight to 10 millimoles. Um, and so an example of that might be 20 by 30 second hill sprints um, at eight millimole with 90 seconds jog recovery. So, so pretty horrible, but not a lot of time there. A threshold training though, can happen four to six times a week. It's guided by lactate between 2.5 to 4.4 millimoles. Typically re recovery is quite short and often you'll see these double threshold days, remembering a new definition of threshold, not going to the well. And an example of that is, is six by six minute efforts with 60 to 90 seconds rest or jog in between. So why does that work? I won't read through all of those. I'll highlight a few important ones. The low intensity training probably leads to increased oxidative metabolism. Our, our ability to um, clear products or produce energy through, through oxidative means. So developing our aerobic engine. Our high intensity training likely increases VO2 max. We recruit those high threshold motor units typically only recruited in maximal competitions. So they're the big fibers I was talking about. Those big fibers need um, more of a uh, stimulus or they have a higher threshold before they're recruited. So we need to occasionally do something of a higher stimulus to recruit them. Likely though, the, the purpose of the threshold is that we probably run into this improved muscle specific clearing of lactate. So we get better at clearing lactate, but most importantly from this table, which comes from a review article by, by Backen and others, is this term here, decreased central and peripheral fatigue, which allows for more sessions. Decreased central and peripheral fatigue, which allows for more sessions. That's important. If we can reduce the amount of peripheral fatigue at the muscle by reducing the amount of load and damage we have and we can de decrease central fatigue so decreasing 
um, inflammation and decreasing that fight or flight response, then maybe we can do more sessions. Again, back to that um, training, or back to that um, study that looked at the training in runners, they said it may be speculated that training near lactate threshold two optimizes the number of motor units recruited without the consequences of elevated levels of catecholamines likely to be experienced with zone three training. Catecholamines um, are, are a particular um, type of um, amine in the body and uh, um, examples of those are adrenaline and, and um, noradrenaline, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, and, and there are things that I was talking about that, that trigger that um, fight or flight response. And so maybe if we can rein it back a little bit, we can do a bit more. And so what did a typical Norwegian running program look like? Um, this is taken straight from the horse's mouth um, and, and is in large part what the Ingebrigtsen brothers did um, and Marius back in. So Monday morning, slow running 15 kz1 afternoon 12 kz1 with some sprints at zone five and technique now when they say um, sprints in zone five that's of a six zone scale so they're not certainly certainly not you know you're not picturing 100 meter sprints um, at the athletics carnival we're talking closer to, to strides and surges tuesday a.m um, a warm up jog of 5k, then five to six minutes at 2.5 millimole, recovering one minute between um, sets. In the Arvo, 10 by one kilometer at 3.5 millimoles, recovering at one, one minute between. So you can see there, five by six minutes and 10 by 1k, that's a lot of stimulus. If you were thinking about your traditional idea of threshold, you, you couldn't do that. You'd break down after two days. Wednesday, 16 kilometers easy in strength training. I'm not exactly sure what strength training was. They're not particularly clear around that. Evening, uh, 10K, again, with, with surges and technique. Whoops. Um, Thursday, 5 by 2K at 2.5 millimole. At night, 25 by 400 at 3.5 millimole with 30 second recovery in between. Um, so they're always pushing that point where they're getting close to lactate threshold, but never exceeding it. Now, I should point out the Norwegians measure with great detail. So after every five reps, they'll be measuring lactate. And if you were doing 25 by 400, um, measuring every fifth rep, and you went from 3.5 to 4, you would be told to slow down. If you went from four to five, you might be told to get off the track for three minutes um, and then go again. And so they're not just continually pushing because lactate will increase for the same workload over time because we're getting fatigued and we get um, less able at, at clearing it, which is that lactate stacking. Uh, Friday is an easy day of 15K, not, nothing in the other. Saturday, 20 by 200 meter hill sprints, recovering with 60 seconds. Easy jog in the Arvo, long run um, on Sunday. Now, that's a typical program. So I'm going to quickly move into two case studies. The first one is a case study from cycling. Um, and the reason I'm showing you a case study from cycling is that cycling has no eccentric load or shock. There is no ground reaction force. There's no impact from cycling. You don't strike the ground. And so if there is a um, change from the Norwegian model in training, then it has to be because of optimization of, of metabolic processes. So what did we do with Nick? Um, so I was working with Nick, he's coached by Jared from, from Trivalo, Jared Donnelly, um, and, I, and I was advising Jared um, about how we might structure this Norwegian training, but I certainly can't claim the success for Nick. But with Nick, as I showed earlier, he rode along at increasing intensities from 250 to 375, and I measured his lactate and his heart rate. Um, from that, we, we worked out the, the curve, the relationship here, and we used that to create a, a calculator. You know, at 310 watts, his lactate would be 2.9 millimoles and his heart rate would be 140. Um, the reason we did that, because the problem with recording lactate all the time, it's invasive and it's um, expensive and it's not always available. Um, the coach, one of the Norwegian coaches from the triathlon team, um, Olav Alexander Boo, who is the coach of um, Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden, 
claims that last year he took around 20,000 lactate measurements. Now, those lactate strips are 3 to $4 each. So we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of $60,000 on lactate measurements. Um, you want to be charging a fair bit from your athletes to do that. Um, so we can't do that. And so so what we did with Nick is, is we used other measures. So things like um, we anchored to power. So we knew that certain power would produce certain lactates. Heart rates would produce a certain lactate. Um, also rate of perceived exertion. Three millimoles felt like a seven, four millimoles felt like an eight out of 10 you know, um, in terms of perceived exertion. The other thing though we used to inform his training was was breath phrases. So remember I talked about when we try to buffer, we breathe more. And so we used bre breath phrases and those phrases were uh, for easy, easy rides. It is, I can say this sentence comfortably and slowly or slowly and comfortably. Um, and then at moderate intensity, it was, I can speak this sentence. And then at difficult intensities, it was can't talk or can't speak. Um, and so we use those things combined to inform us how hard we were going, how close we were getting to the fire. And we did repeat testing as well. His training, I won't spend too much time on it, conscious of time. If it looks like it's taken straight from back in, it's because it was. Monday was easy zone one. Tuesday was six by five minutes at 2.5 to three millimoles. Um, in the Arvo, eight by three minutes at 3.5 millimoles. Wednesday, um, zone one to two ride, no more than two hours. In the Arvo, 1.5 hour ride with some surges, um, which are much like the strides in running. Thursday, AM, same as Tuesday, six by five minutes. PM, 25 by one minute at four millimoles at, off 30 seconds. Friday, zone one to two ride, no more than th three hours, no surges. Saturday, two sets of 10 by 30 seconds at eight millimoles, so around about 440 watts, um, with 75 seconds rest between and three to five minutes between sets. Extend the ride to four hours or perform another um, two hours during the um, zone one during the um, evening. Sunday, um, zone one to two ride are four to five hours long. Now, the reason we added a lot of that um, extended rides around zone one to zone two is that cycling isn't middle distance running. Uh, you know, it, it, the longest event in running, conventional running, if we don't um, straight to ultras, you know, is the marathon. It's taking, depending on who you are, two to four hours. Um, cycling races, you know, much longer than that. Nick, Nick was training for, for gravel races up around eight hours. Um, as well as the Tour of Bright and the time trial um, at Road Nationals. And so how did it work for Nick? Prior to the eight-week Norwegian block, his five-minute power was 420. After it increased to 460 or 5.8 to 6.7 watts per kilo. His 20-minute power went from 376 slightly down to 366. However, his relative power went up. So his body weight dropped from 72 to 68. So it went from 5.2 to 5.5 watts a kilo. His heart resting heart rate dropped. Um, and we've recently gone into another Norwegian block. It's done exactly the same thing. I, I'm going to suggest it's probably an increase in cardiac output. And his heart rate variability uh, became balanced. Take heart rate variability for what it's worth um, and particularly measured off Garmin. But Really, it's a measure of, of stress. Um, so a more variable heart rate is a good thing. Less variable tells us that we're probably activating that sympathetic pathway um, and not rested. So he became um, more rested um, with the Norwegian model. So we had improvements on pretty much every metric, um, including powers above the prescribed thresholds, which is something we weren't expecting for him to, to um, improve on his five, three, five minute power, even though we didn't really focus on that. Did it work? Well, he won the Tour of Bright um, and he won the time trial both at, at Road Nationals, um, both things that he's been trying to win in his divisions for quite a, an amount of time. Um, and so we had dramatic transformations with Nick. Now, as I said, cycling isn't running. It doesn't have um, a value where we, we uh, uh, strike the ground. It doesn't have that damage associated with it. Running does. Um, and so this is a case study of um, running with Cam, Cam um, and we did exactly the same thing. So we had our 1K loop out the back of Buninyong. Cam ran at increasing intensities from 350 to 320. And along the way, we took 
blood lactate. And you can see here it's gone from 0 0.9 to 4.6. Um, we created the same little calculator there to work out, you know, at 328 pace, his lactate would be three millimoles. Um, and so we were doing the same idea conceptually as Nick. That looks pretty similar to the Norwegian um, style I showed you earlier. So Monday was an easy jog. Um, Tuesday morning, five by six minute set efforts. PM, 20 by 400 meters off 30 seconds. Wednesday, um, easy jog, 12K easy. Thursday um, was supposed to be four by 2K in the morning um, and 10 by 1K in the evening. Now that day we had to flick it around because life gets in the way. Uh, but it's still the same idea that you saw earlier. Thursday, 14k easy. Um, Saturday, 20 by 200 meter hill repeats um, off 75 seconds. And Sunday, 30k long run and, and 7.5 double in the afternoon. He was preparing for a soccer mar marathon, hence the high volume there. His focus was, was threshold, as I said, and he, he got around 150k's a week. Um, so one, one intended effect of this Norwegian model is that we took Cam's mileage from around 110 to, to 120 up to around 150 um, just by optimizing the time he spent at threshold because ultimately he's spending more time running at higher pace. When we did that, we also optimize his training load. So this is taken from Intervals, um, a, a website, intervals.ocu, and we can see this blue line represents his fitness, which is trending up, and this purple line represents his day-to-day -day fatigue. And you can see there's not too many variations in there. A little bit of a deload period here before we ramp up again. Um, prior to that, though, when he wasn't doing the Norwegian model, we see this, where fitness is going up, but it's less so. It's 60 instead of 70, which is just a metric that interval um, works based off speeds, paces, heart, heart rates. Um, but we have this up, down, up, down, up, down. And that's characterized by the typical going to the well, needing two days to recover, well, recover, well, recover. Um, and so we weren't optimizing that training in, in, a, in a traditional sense. And we certainly were when we switched across to the Norwegian model. What that led to was an increase in performance from one, two, four, eight, half, full everything increased all these performances got faster before that period cam struggled to get below 320 pace um now he can run below three minute pace quite quite comfortably in efforts um i mean they're hard efforts but he but he can he can certainly do that um and so we had those mechanical benefits as well from spending those time at higher zones what did that mean for cam um he ran a Saka marathon and PB'd on an extraordinarily difficult day when many people didn't PB and many pulled out. And if we see his rankings, he's gone from 1300th to 357. He's ran through the field. He, he's um, become, he ran very evenly. Now, we were aiming for sub 240, and I genuinely believe we would have achieved that um, were the conditions a little bit more favorable. Um, and so we use the Norwegian model for him as a way to do the work before we did the work. So we did the Norwegian block and then moved into a more traditional marathon block with bigger sessions, for instance, five by 5K. Um, but we always maintained some speed focus once a week. So it might've been 20 by 200 or, or 30 by 30 seconds. Um, but I might sound like the, I, I'm claiming that the Norwegian model is the best thing and you, and you should all be doing that for your training. That's not necessarily the case. There are some limitations of the model a and they are that it ignores very high intensity work and it's probably not good for short anaerobic training. Um, even the Norwegians do periods closer to competitions where they're going above threshold. Um, if you're training for the 400 or below, this is not the model for you. The biggest limitation I see, though, is the psychological load. So here are two quotes, one from Nick, one from Cam. Nick said, it feels like a pretty big mental task. My training has always been in the morning and the mentality has always been get up, get a coffee and then get training out of the way. Physiologically, it's no problem at all. Cam said, it's hard to get up and about for a double session. I just want to get training done. I sometimes get bored and feel myself drifting off in the second session. That's a big consideration. The, the Norwegian um, training model 
is boring and getting up for a second session, not structuring your day around, just getting out early and getting it done is mentally taxing. I've done a lot um, and I could speak from experience there. So my opinion, the Norwegian model isn't a, a revolution in, in training, it's, it's an evolution. It's the perfection of monitoring of intensity that allows for more concentrated loading. But because of the highest psychological cost, I think of it as something to use sparingly and as a method to do the work before you do the work. So as a six to eight week block before you move into some other type of training. It's probably perfect for long distance triathlon because of the distance and duration of the event. They're not having to go that hard and they get to train for three sports. Um, what I think the most important thing is to take away from tonight is that in order to optimize your training, you need to think about monitoring your load and dosing it accordingly. And it doesn't always necessarily mean going to the well. So how does this look for the future um, in terms of monitoring? Some of this stuff is future. A lot of this is already available. Um, this is my last slide. Um, we've got to the point now where we're getting pretty good technology. So Continuous blood glucose monitors are already available. You can always see your blood, already see your blood glucose in real time. So you can know if you're starting to dip into those glycogen stores. Mu muscle oxygen sensors, so Moxie, Clomp, for example, um, tell us when we're crossing our threshold or, or try to tell us when we're crossing our threshold um, by measuring oxygen saturation in the blood. Less oxygen in the blood, probably crossing a threshold. We have continuous blood lactate sen sensors. There are two companies currently trying to make that technology and it looks pretty much ready to launch. It'll go to an app on your phone, you'll be able to record lactate. Core body temperature, if you know temperature's going up, you can bet lactate will as well. Uh, and truly portable VO2. This looks a bit futuristic, but it is available. You can buy this already. It's called a Calibre Biometrics Mask. It's not too expensive compared to other systems. Um, and so the integration of all of this together, I, I, I wouldn't be running with that mask on the track, but maybe occasionally, uh, just from a vanity perspective. But the integration of all that together will help us load um, or, or help us monitor load better. And it's what the Norwegian long distance triathletes are already doing. All of this together with big data and AI driven analytics will probably change the, the future of sports science training. However, a core question that I have is at what point does it all become a bit like F1 um, and we take away some innocence and some excitement of training because we're monitoring too much um, and I would really hate the situation where people are running along in a marathon with all of these sensors on you know and getting told to slow down or speed up because your rival's dipping too much into their glucose or their lactate spiked or whatever it is and so i would really like to see this technology um, used in training to guide to optimize to manage load and not be allowed in in racing um, that is it for the moment i know i've gone a bit over time are there any questions I will uh, read some for you. Um, so the first one, I guess, is um, it sounds like, and you can just probably yes or no this, the, the Ballarat Marathon in a week and a half, and then people looking to do, say, a Melbourne Marathon in October-ish, when that is. Could this be a, a training base or something you do in between the two? So straight after Ballarat Marathon and then do some proper marathon training before the Melbourne event? Uh, yeah, you certainly could. So I would obviously respect the marathon. You need need time off or, or time down after the marathon. And, you know, the old ad adage is roughly one day per mile. It's not a hard and fast rule. Super shoes change that to a degree because um, you recover better. Um, but once you have had that period down, three, four, five weeks, then, yeah, you could, you could rebuild with the Norwegian model. Maybe start with a a month of general jogging and then move into this model where you're trying to add intensity back into your training in a concentrated way um, before you then move into a traditional marathon block. Uh, and then for the average person trying to find out what that lactate threshold is or be able to do some of this testing 
where would they be able to do that at the moment without those uh, so devices? You, you could certainly go um, to a sports science lab. So we have that um, at Federation here, um, and we're able to do lactate testing and iron oxygen testing as well. Um, but if you don't want to do that, if you want to do it um, more accurately, you can you can buy your own lactate monitor. They're not that expensive to buy at around seven hundred dollars. As I said, strips are around three dollars each. Um, but you can certainly hire them as well. There are a number of coaches that that use them. Um, and so, if you wanted that testing, you could come here, or you could consider buying buying your own lactate monitor. What I would so say though, and I, I'm not necessarily recommending this. But you could kind of do it without the lactate. So you could use those other anchors. Does it feel like a seven out of ten RPE? Um, am I out of breath when I, when I'm running? Is it is it too difficult? Um, and and if those things are in line, then then you're probably not over that threshold. And so you could use that as a bit of way to to guide your training. Perfect. And then is it something if you if you were to go down the path of getting tested? Um, or doing lactate testing and even VO2 max testing is it something that you would do sort of during the program as well. So say you started at week one of the program um, or you're looking at a Norwegian sort of style program and going below threshold, would you then do it halfway through? Like they're testing all the time, obviously, but would you go again halfway through to see whether that's changed? Yep. Yeah, I would. And I wouldn't necessarily go all the way um, with the VO2 testing again. I don't think you really need that, but I, it, it could be quite focused. So if you knew that four millimole for you occurred at four minute pace, then you, you know you start five seconds slower than that. So 405. Um, and, and if training's done its job, you might only need a few measurements, um, you know, run 20 seconds faster than than, than where you were beforehand um, and, and you'll get there pretty quick. And so that could be a relatively straightforward cost effective test. But I'd certainly, um, you know, advise, assess, don't guess. Yeah, and uh, you're probably about a minute quicker than I'd be going um, for that test. It might be five minutes and 505s. Um, and when you're hitting that, so like you spoke about earlier in the uh, first section about like being just below is a big difference to sort of just over that pace. So if you were doing a 455 pace, you might be able to do that comfortably through 30k, say, but if you went to a 450, well, that may be that you, you'd be killing yourself at the 20 kilometer mark. Um. That's a great question. The, the answer, I mean, in your context, it's it's I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that you haven't run a marathon. And so we don't actually know what your marathon pace is until you cross the line. Um, but, but to answer more broadly, um, and this is kind of outside the scope of the Norwegian model, but patience in, is everything in, in that marathon. If, if you're getting those feelings that you're breathing too hard and you ask yourself is this beyond a seven out of ten Th then you're going too hard it it's going to be excruciating from 30 onwards um and so yeah you could you, you could think about uh, using the, the the idea around understanding threshold in that way that you want to start slow and, and finish at the same speed really um now, now finding that's a, a, a fine line but I would think if you don't feel great through halfway, you've probably done something wrong. Yeah, I think that uh, echoes what Julian said in the first um, session we had as well, is it's really got to be easy through the first half. Um, yeah. And, and, if you're feeling and good, you're probably going too fast, like slow down still. For sure. And, and up until, I mean, his last two, perhaps not, but, uh, but before that, um, that's that is Julian has a track record of executing marathons of, of negative negative splitting them um, tremendously well, and I and I think that comes from as you said, just practicing patience. Um, it's it's hard to do. You've done all the training, you're excited to see someone run past, and you, and you want to follow them. Excellent. I think that could wrap it up. Um, Really good presentation, Ryan, um, and some good detail. And as I say, I think it'd be something that a lot of people watch, rewatch, come back to and look at some of those slides and try and um, adapt and develop their own uh, training method for the next one. So. Perfect. Thank you very much, everyone, um, for attending. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can email them through if you like.
um, to r.warn, W-O-R-N, at federation.edu.au. I'm happy to chat all things about, about running and sports science. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you.